singing and reading about wheat tears, right? Uh, so I start with some, with some sad facts. The sad fact is that throughout history, including if you read the book of Acts, throughout history, the church has been scandalized by immoral, illegal, and uh, cruel behavior of the members, and, and especially prominent people leaders and people that may make high claims. Um, we, we talked about the Reformation here just a little bit. And, and the problem is that the Reformation was necessary because evil people had seized control of the, the, the leadership of the church and they had corrupted the church to the core. And the truth of the matter is we are still feeling the effects of that corruption um, oh, uh, over 500 years from, from the time it was going on. Um, in virtually every congregation, as I look around here, if you have been around uh, church very long, you have been involved in a church squabble and uh, probably a church split. Uh, I will tell you, I don't know how many people I know who came to church and it was such a good thing and things were going good until somebody came along, started a fight, and what people do is, is many people leave, but they leave church, period. Because, uh, thinking, you know, I can live, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate church. And we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, Gene Edwards, who uh, wrote the book, uh, Preventing a Church Split, uh, makes the kind of quip where he says, you know, uh, people are, the churches are either uh, getting ready for a split, they're in a split, or they're recovering from a split. And uh, while it's funny, the problem with that is there's an element of truth to it, and we have that. Um, Let's broaden it out outside of the church. Um, evil has invaded even our sacred spaces. What, three weeks ago today, an evil, evil man came into a church much like ours, killed 26 people, injured 20, and uh, just uh, made it awful. Uh, and, and, and the thing of it is, if this was maybe isolated, but we have, uh, we've had it happen as close as uh, Flint on the west side for us, and, and different churches around Philadelphia had, uh, had just terrible things happen, and evil has invaded our, our sacred spaces. And then when we begin to uh, think about the, uh, the world, um, the, the, it's just plain evil. We think about the shootings in Las Vegas. Or we talk about the, the online murders of ISIS. Or the tyranny of evil dictators. Or the corruption that just seems universal in uh, national and regional and local governments. It just seems like you got government, you got corruption. And uh, uh, it just, it's just so bad. It's because of this um, all ever present, all presence of evil uh, that have caused many people 
to take the doctrine of the kingdom and push it into the future. Now the problem with that is Jesus clearly made it plain that the kingdom, excuse me, the kingdom started with his coming. But when we take a look at some of the prophecies in Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, about uh, the peace and the justice that's supposed to happen, and we don't see that happening right now, we have a tendency to push it into the future. Well, we must understand the kingdom did come with power with Christ. The disciples did see it. But we haven't seen all that has been prophesied about the kingdom. And we talk about the kingdom here and now, and then we talk about the consummation or the end of things when evil is thoroughly dealt with. Now, the question, though, becomes, Pastor John, um, how do we explain all this? How do we explain all this evil in the midst of the kingdom of God? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because Jesus answered it in the parable of the wheat and the tares. He's talking about something here that is very, very uh, uh, understandable. Uh, but it's something, if we push the kingdom into the future, doesn't make any sense. So, um, this kingdom experiment, now under, let's talk about the word picture. Um, that was our scripture reading. Uh, it's real simple. Um, the farmer plants a <coughs> seed, an enemy comes along and contaminates it. If you get your modern translations, I intentionally substituted the word Darnell in there for a reason you'll understand. Our modern translations say weeds. Uh, but the discovery of the treachery happens near harvest. Um, the, uh, the, the workers want to pull it up right then. Uh, the farmer says no. Because if you pull it up now, you're going, to, you're going to hurt some of the wheat and just let it go until harvest. And harvest, we're going to separate it and um, the, uh, the weeds will be burned and the wheat will be gathered into the barn. Now, the question comes, and especially with the translation of weeds, if you think about it, why would an enemy even bother with something like that? Okay, now look. Uh, we live in farming country, and weeds are a fact of life in our fields, okay? Now, we do our best to control them and stuff like that, but what, why would an enemy, what, what damage, how much damage could a, an enemy do coming out, throwing in some thistles or throwing in some grass and whatever on that? Um, okay, so uh, it's going to... Uh, maybe uh, hurt the yields a little bit and things like that. But there's no permanent damage to that. I mean, uh, why would someone want to get up in the middle of the night and do something that may be a nuisance, but it's not going to damage Why? What kind of an enemy thing on that? And so you have to ask the question, why would he bother? Well, the, the, the problem is in the word uh, translated weeds. Jesus used a very specific term that his hearers understood. And uh, the old English word for it is tares. Uh, but uh, what our word for it is, and what we would call, is a species of darnel. darnel. And uh, let's talk about what darnel is. It resembles wheat in its appearance. Uh, and if you'll notice here, here's wheat, there's tares, or there now. And you can see that while you can tell the difference, they're very, very similar. Uh, here's what it would look like in a ripened field. Uh, you can see the wheat in there, you can see the tares growing in there. The difference is here you can see them. You can see that this is bearded and wheat is not. In fact, it's got that beard on. Okay, well, so we can talk about that. So what? Well, the seeds are poisonous to humans and plant-eating animals. Okay? It produces sleepiness, nausea, 
dizziness, convulsions, and even death. Now, all of a sudden, we're starting to talk about something that an enemy would do. Uh, because if you try and feed it to your cows or your sheep, uh, you're going to kill them. Uh, if, you, if you get it mixed in with your food, it's going to make you sick. Okay, that starts to make some sense. Now, uh, you, you do have to understand, though, that it was added, that farmers would add it to beer and to uh, bread, and it'd make them hot. Okay. Um, in fact, the, the Latin name for it, and I can't say it, so I won't, but it comes from the, the word that means beer. So the idea of mind-altering and whatever is what's behind this thing. So, uh, when you start talking about that, an enemy would do something like that. You want to uh, poison a man's food supply, poison uh, whatever he's going to do. That, uh, and especially if you're not paying attention, you can see they look an awful lot alike. And so that's that's what is uh, that's what he's talking about. So pardon me if if I'm too much of a theologian, but weeds doesn't hardly tell the story. Okay, yeah, he's talking about something that's uh, in there. Okay, well, we've got that. Now, let's talk about the explanation. Um, the crowd left and went into the house, and, and uh, uh, then he left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds stand. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be and will throw them into the fiery furnace and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, uh, the explanation, you know, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, or Jesus. Uh, the field, of course, is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the righteous. Um, I, uh, Christians, if you will. Um, that They are good seeds. On the other hand, weeds are the sons of the evil one. Um, they are a subversive, toxic presence. Okay? Uh, the enemy, of course, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age or the consummation. Notice it doesn't happen till the end. And the harvesters are the angels. Okay. So, let's apply this. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like, in, the study of, in a study of the world's literature, Darnell shows up as a symbol of subversion. It's been used for hundreds of years, meaning that. And one person says, where there is Darnell, there is treachery and toxicity. Wow. Now we're talking about some people here, aren't we, huh? Well, having said that, let's just make some observations. First, the kingdom here and now will be contaminated by the presence of evil people. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but I can tell you, as are you beginning to understand why you will periodically hear me pray, Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around us? But the truth is, Satan wants to put toxic people among us and destroy what we have. Hmm. Well, that's 
not a happy note, but it's a realistic. Okay? Does that make am I making sense here? Yeah. <laughs> I hate to be the message bearer of bear, 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 bad news, but but this is this is what the, what uh, you know Jesus was talking about. Second of all, these poisonous people may closely resemble the true people of God. This is the thing that I've noticed uh, when I have, I, uh, unfortunately, I've been through more conflicts than I care to uh, admit as a pastor. But oftentimes, it's the people who are, who often strive for leadership position. They claim to be so spiritual. You'll hear them talk about their prayer life and how much they give and all that kind of stuff. They may closely resemble the true people of God. Boy, I'm kind of dealing a blow to toleration this morning, aren't I? They closely resemble. What you have to understand I, I can tell you, even as a pastor, you have difficulty dealing with it. Because if you deal with some of these situations, you will literally hurt the good people. I know of a situation where a church had a, uh, a rather gifted uh, worship leader. And the worship leader had worked his way into the hearts of many of the people. However, behind the scenes, this worship leader was uncooperative. Uh, the worship leader uh, went among the people and undermined uh, the pastor and undermine uh, the things that were going on and created havoc. But the naive people didn't know it. They didn't see it. Why? Oh, have such wonderful worship services. The Spirit is just here. <coughs> well, things finally reached a point to where the leadership had to deal with it. And the worship leader was dismissed. Pulled up the problem. And much of the congregation left too. Many of the good people left. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Makes it tough, doesn't it? Makes it tough. The problem is sometimes you just have to deal with problems and take the losses. I mean, you just have to do it. You don't have much choice. Because you can't allow evil to go on unabated and whatever. You, there, there are times when you do have to deal with it. But in the sense that all of us would like to see where uh, the, these things are taken care of and this evil influence is removed uh, unfortunately it's not going to happen until Jesus comes again until the consummation of the kingdom and at that point uh, it's going to be Katie by the door you get to see that's where we are it's not going to happen until then what's that mean? Paul gave us some admonition in a couple of scriptures. First of all, personally, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Have you ever been around people who want to fight? They, they just, they just, if you say it's red, they'll say it's blue, regardless. And they just 
Uh, whatever it has, they're going to fight. They're going to do it. I, I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. Um, but Paul said, on a personal note, when you begin to identify these things and you begin to, uh, to get around them, you live it as, 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 as far as it's within you. It's under your Now, again, what's, what's Paul recognizing? Sometimes it's not possible. Right? Sometimes. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up on Thursday. Have any of you got a family member like that? <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. uh, I know what you are. <laughs> You're a tear. <laughs> and that's either T A R E or T E R R O R. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but but uh, but you but you see what we're talking about. As far as it depends on you, to be at peace. And then he has this to say. Speaking to the church. I urge you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way contrary to the teaching that you've learned. I like the King James here. The King James says, brothers, mark those who cause division and contrary to the teaching. Mark them. <laughs> And here's what I here's here's what I think of. I think of an old bald guy, uh, like on the movies, and put a big X on that bald spot. <laughs> or maybe or maybe you make him wear you know those pennies that we that we would wear when we were in gym class for the teens. Put a put a big X on him, mark him. But uh, and watch out for him. Don't be so naive. Watch out for people who cause division. Now you watch some people. There are some people that wherever they go, you will find division going on. Watch them. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. I think I just told that story, didn't I? <coughs> smooth talk, flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy for you. But I want you to be wise about what's good and innocent about what is evil. What more can I say? Paul said it best. It's something we've got to live with. It's how we deal with it. And so, the Apostle John said, Brothers, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits and see them there. So, parable of wheat and tares. Very simple. Very, very simple. But Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom of God. Like I say, part of what we have here then when, we, when we're looking at that kind of a uh, thing, I hope that what it does is it lowers our expectations. Hmm. It lowers our expectations. Because see, what we do, we come to church and we want it to be really, really nice and really, really peaceful and believe me, we work hard to make sure it's here. Uh, we love people. We love, and when I say we work hard, I'm talking about me and thee. You work as hard at it as I do or anyone else. It's something we work at. We have our disagreements. But one of the things I've watched about you is you work through those. Okay? There's a time for forgiveness and time for whatever. But we have to understand that the church is in heaven and the consummation hasn't happened and that the kingdom is at war with evil and the evil one is trying to infiltrate and contaminate the people of God. I close with a note of thanksgiving. 
Aren't you glad you're wheat? <laughs> I, I'm dead serious. Now, now okay, it, it's one thing. It's it's not a brag. It's a trust that we have. That we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We see how He not only forgave us our sins, but He transformed our lives. And we are in the process of becoming more and more and more Christ-like. And as we mature and as the time comes towards harvest, we begin to see the fruit of our lives and the fruit that we bear, and we're bearing good fruit. Now, that's all praise to God and thankfulness that He would ever chose, choose us and allow us to be numbered among good seed. And this week of thanksgiving, we need to thank God that He chose us. And rather than just when we come to Thanksgiving here and say, well, I thank God for my salvation. <coughs> begin to take that about two or three levels deeper. And begin to realize that we've been transformed. And that He's changed us. And, it, it, and our salvation is something to Amen. be thankful for. Right. Amen? Amen? Did you catch what's going to happen to these evil people? What's going to happen to them? They're going to burn. Now I know there's a lot of theology out there today that says there's no hell. But this is what preacher is going to tell you the truth. If you are toxic, if you are hard to get along with, if you are a troublemaker, if you uh, bring division, if you are a liar, you're going to burn in hell. But I'm not. <laughs> and the congregation that I'm looking at here, I don't think any of you are. And that's something to be very, very, very thankful for. Because when the consummation comes, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Okay? But the kingdom is here. And believe it or not, we're winning. Amen. Amen. So, with that in mind, I thought that the song that we would close with is thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Amen. Let us stand. <coughs> Father, we thank you that you ever chose us. We're thankful that you made us your children. We're thankful that you ever even allowed us to even consider ourselves good seed. Oh, Father, please. Oh, Father, please. Help us to be just that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving our souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.